All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Anna Jankis, Marketing Coordinator at Core BTS, and welcome to today's webinar, Data Theft from the Inside, Internal Penetration Testing. Throughout our presentation this morning, we encourage you to interact with us by typing questions and comments using the Q&A pane. We'll be answering questions live both during the event and after the presentation, so feel free to interrupt us. We're recording today's session, and we'll make the link to the recording available after the event via email. Today on our panel, we have Nick Dulesky, Principal Consultant for Core BTS Security and Compliance Practice, Matt Wilson, Managing Consultant for the Core BTS Security and Compliance Practice, and Tim Grelling, Principal Consultant for the Core BTS Security and Compliance Practice. Uh, Nick, Tim, and Matt are here to help answer your questions, so feel, please feel free to use, utilize them this morning as resources. And at this time, I'll pass along to Nick to get us started. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to start off saying uh, if anybody's ever having trouble uh, hearing me, uh, if anybody has any questions about any uh, acronyms I might be using, any terms that you're not familiar with, please absolutely feel free to use the Q&A panel. Um, you know, I, I do have uh, uh, Matt assisting me in here today so that he can just kind of pull me aside and uh, ask me to explain something a little bit further. So I'd much rather people ask up front and, uh, you know, so that they're able to understand the uh, uh, subject at hand rather than have to catch up later. So, um, once again, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I have been at Core BTS for a little over three years at this point, um, performed many, many uh, pen tests. Uh, my tenure here, um, both external, internal, uh, with social engineering, without social engineering. Um, penetration testing is, is something that I enjoy because you always get to do something different. Um, today we're speaking about internal penetration testing um, specifically, but usually uh, the concepts are applicable uh, regardless of, of uh, you know, sort of the network position you have. And, uh, hopefully, uh, everybody can get something out of, out of today's presentation. Uh, I come from a background in uh, uh, defensive security and systems administration, uh, in addition to the offensive security that I performed here at CORE. Um, I was a uh, security analyst for a software company that um, served the banking industry, uh, so very familiar with, uh, you know, uh, financial firms, uh, sorts of, of rules and regulations that they have to deal with in terms of uh, penetration testing and uh, securing those systems. Um, systems administration um, worked in a, a number of different uh, capacities with a number of different operating systems and platforms. So uh, I come from a very technical background. That means that, uh, you know, I will throw around technical information uh, readily. Again, please stop me if I throw out anything that uh, is um, a uh, little bit too technical or you need a little bit more background on in order to uh, uh, kind of know where we are, where we're going with, uh, with the presentation. So quick agenda uh, for today's presentation. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, a quick overview of what internal penetration testing is, how we usually define it um, in, in our statements of work, uh, a little bit of background on penetration testing overall. Uh, then we're going to get into some of the common themes uh, of uh, problems and challenges that we see uh, in our typical internal penetration test. Depending on your organization's uh, history and that experience with penetration testing, uh, some of these problems might sound familiar. Uh, some of them you might be hearing for the first time. So uh, again, hopefully everybody can get something out of that. Uh, and then we'll move on uh, to discuss some of the common control approaches that we see uh, some of the more effective ways to uh, use your security efforts to defeat some of the techniques that I'll mention in the, the uh, previous section. And finally, I'd like to give ample time for question and answer. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, if there's something that uh, I did not cover during the presentation that you'd like to learn more about, uh, by all means, uh, please feel free to uh, ask away uh, during the question and answer section. More than happy to, uh, uh, to help. So penetration testing is a specific type of, of security assessment that uh, really is, is focused on measuring uh, practical information security. Um, the way I like to explain it, penetration testing will test a combination of two different things. 
And you can concentrate more on one than the other, but they're, they're pretty much interrelated as vulnerability management and incident response. Uh, simplistically speaking, it's uh, anything that you do to prevent something bad from happening falls under the vulnerability management bucket. Everything that you do after something bad happens falls under the incident response bucket. When you're performing a penetration test, um, you can throw every attack at the wall and try and, uh, you know, blanket all the possibilities for exploitation you can. If you do that, then you're not being very stealthy in the penetration test. You're not really getting an accurate uh, gauge of, all right, are my incident responders on the ball? Are they looking at the logs? Would they catch uh, the types of attacks I'm throwing in the real world? Um, the reality is uh, a lot of attacks are, are much more stealthy than that. Uh, you wouldn't go after um, you know, every single IP with the same set of attacks. You'd be much more judicious in the uh, uh, packets that you do send. You'd take more time to uh, uh, you know, throw uh, investigators off of your scent. Um, and basically, you just um, move a little bit slower. The reality is that when we're doing a penetration test, we do have uh, some time and scheduling constraints to make sure that we can get you a report and a time frame that you can use. So we're never going to be uh, exactly like one of the bad guys who can afford to uh, scout and slowly uh, develop an attack over the period of, of, of weeks and months. Um, most people just don't have the timelines uh, in their uh, in their project plans for that. And so that, that's a known uh, difference between us and the bad guys. Not only that, um, you know, we do have um, moral, ethical, and legal obligations that we must fulfill. So we're never going to be able to, um, we're never going to be able to perform some, uh, you know, particular types of attacks that the bad guys might. Uh, not only that, we do have to respect um, the laws about uh, the types of, of things we're allowed to do. Uh, international law gets a little bit tricky when it comes to penetration testing, uh, so we do have to be careful. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly, uh, if you are looking at performing a pen test, we can kind of go over those things uh, in our initial uh, conversation, see if there might be some um, some unique circumstances that we have to consider. Um, but by and large, most organizations. Uh, we can put together a penetration test that would, uh, that would serve you, that would give you some useful feedback on how your information security program really is doing. So internal penetration testing specifically um, simulates uh, a number of different threats. Um, while we may have components where we are physically entering a facility, um, there are other situations that if, uh, an internal penetration test can indeed uh, simulate. So, whenever you have a compromised internal workstation, uh, you know, that basically has the same perspective uh, as um, somebody who, who is physically on, on the inside of your building, on the inside of your network. Uh, in many cases, if there's a con uh, uh, command and control channel that goes outside of your network into uh, some sort of infrastructure run by um, the attacker, be he a uh, lone wolf attacker or part of an organized crime uh, sort of uh, outfit, um, you know, he has that perspective. Uh, he, is, he has the access to that internal system and can leverage it um, pretty much in, in any way that he wants. Obviously, there are some restrictions and, and caveats to that, um, but certainly we don't want to underestimate uh, the enemies that are out there, uh, by and large, what they do is they put food on their own table using cybercrime. Uh, that can be a powerful motivator, and uh, you know, especially when they're very smart people uh, that realize that they can stand to make a lot of money by doing some of these things. Um, you know, it's it's it can be dangerous to to uh, peg everybody as a uh, uh, amateur or or somebody who uh, is just uh, messing around with Metasploit. So there are some similarities to um, uh, penetration testing, both on an internal and an external perspective. Um, the reconnaissance process is very, very similar. Uh, you go out and take a look at uh, publicly available information. 
um, Google searches, uh, look at the company's website, look at the company's um, social media postings, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, any of those things, and take little bits and pieces uh, of information you can get from that and then you know, see how you can use that as part of your uh, attack. Um, you know, job board, job board, job postings, um, a lot of times will give information about the types of technologies and architectures that are uh, used within the organization's infrastructure. Um, not only that, but uh, you can also um, get information about uh, business partners, vendors that the company might work with. If you can pose as somebody that employees are used to seeing, whether it's um, a, a particular uh, security vendor, uh, physical security or uh, IT vendor or uh, other service that you know that uh, the business is associated with, it just adds that extra little bit of uh, veracity to, to a social engineering attack. As I mentioned before, you know, if an external attacker is able to get a foothold on the, onto the internal network, they basically become internal attackers. So um, an external attack prosecuted through till the uh, uh, through till the end, uh, where you're gaining access to internal systems, gaining domain admin, essentially is, is two pen tests in one. Uh, it's an external uh, that becomes an internal, and then uh, the internal gets access to the data or gets access to the uh, to the infrastructure. There are a couple of uh, differences, however, in that for an internal pen test, there are often additional attack vectors available to you. Wireless networks and physical media uh, can be significant risks uh, if not controlled properly. Wireless networks these days, it's kind of difficult to, uh, especially given uh, certain, uh, certain you know, geographical locations and, and uh, you know, placements, it's difficult to really attenuate your wireless network so that they don't travel outside of the building these days. If you're in a highly urban area, uh, you might have um, several neighbors uh, uh, in, in your office building. Uh, there might be some amount of crossover between their signal and yours uh, as far as the actual uh, RF space is concerned. So um, there is that somebody could be physically in a nearby location you don't have control over. Um, physical media analysis, if uh, an attacker is able to get within the physical perimeters of, uh, physical perimeter of, of the facility, uh, things like USB drives, uh, laptops, you know, these days, um, you know, there's immense amounts of data um, potentially on the endpoints especially with the consumerization of, of IT, um, you know, you might not have control over all of those elements of, of, uh, of data these days. Um, certainly the analysis of, of physical media um, can gain not only uh, um, troves of, of uh, NPI itself, also uh, operating system analysis can get you password hashes that you can then crack. Um, gain credentials to the network and use to compromise other systems. By and large, uh, internal penetration testing does tend to look at uh, more of the inside um, creamy center of most organizations. Uh, you see that, you hear that analogy uh, a lot in the information security community. Um, organizations that have the hard outer shell, creamy center, meaning that, uh, you know, everybody's got firewall these days. It's pretty much considered you know, standard networking practice. You've got a firewall, firewall at the perimeter blocking traffic coming in that uh, either you don't know its source or uh, headed to a destination that, you know, they've got no business accessing. However, uh, once you're on the inside, uh, if you have any kind of internal network segmentation, there may or may not be any kind of meaningful access control going on between those network segments. Um, you have a lot more services at work on the inside. Uh, you have things like name resolution occurring. You have uh, many different file sharing uh, protocols going on. You have printing protocols, a whole lot of stuff that you don't generally have to um, deal with 
crossing an external network border. So that means it's a lot more attack surface area for us and a whole lot more to keep track of from the systems administrators. It's not a derogatory term to say that it's a creamy inner center. It's just the reality. It's difficult uh, to really wrap your head around uh, all of the things that are going uh, on inside the network unless you have a, a team of, of people to uh, specifically look at those things. So we already discussed a couple of the options for uh, getting in, getting data, and getting out uh, as part of the penetration tests. Um, what we typically look for when we are uh, getting data from uh, an organization once we've obtained access, uh, we do spend time taking a look for the, the low-hanging fruit. Sometimes you don't need to gain full domain administrator access in order to gain access to valuable data. Um, simple protocols uh, that you wouldn't even necessarily think would be a threat, like SNMP. Um, internally, you might think, oh, well, it's, it's only internal. We don't really have to change the community string. Well, keeping in mind that if you keep that uh, default community string, most, most common one is public, you might be giving away things like um, sensitive file paths, number of uh, and, and names of file shares on that system. You might be giving away uh, information like what network system that node is connected to, uh, how recently has it connected to them, enabling you enabling an attacker to perform a significant amount of surveillance on uh, things on, on devices uh, as varied as network routers to uh, physical access control systems, uh, CCTV systems, and, and even more. So thinking about all those internal uh, systems and protocols really uh, is worth your while to go back and change those defaults, even though you might not think that uh, it could be a, a uh, reasonable attack vector. Uh, I just also wanted to mention when you, we are performing an internal penetration test, uh, paper records uh, are also an important part of the security process. Uh, everybody knows the story about, you know, the person who keeps all the passwords on the post-it note under the keyboard. Uh, that's just one particular instance of, of uh, physical media that can compromise your information security. Um, filing cabinets. Um, records rooms and um, desk drawers are all places where uh, some of the most sensitive informational data, um, organizational data is kept, yet uh, oftentimes it is the, the least thought about these days. Uh, penetration testing, especially internal penetration testing, is a, a great tool to uh, really investigate uh, where your exposure is uh, with physical media. You wouldn't really be able to get that with any other kind of um, penetration test or, or, or technical uh, assessment. Getting the data out of an organization um, is actually a lot easier these days than it used to be. Um, the reasons for that are, are um, the reasons for that are, are, are change, I, I'll say some, some Changes in technology and the accompanying uh, regulations. Get into some of the details of that uh, in a little bit, but you know the obvious uh, um, avenue for for data exfiltration that we have in internal penetration tests uh, that we don't for external is the front door. Obviously, if you can uh, copy data to a USB drive, walk it out the front door, um, you know the best intrusion detection system in the world isn't going to be able to, to stop that. Um, not only that, you know, we do have out-of-band links, uh, much more prevalent these days, mobile hotspots and, and rogue wireless access points. Um, we also do see um, kind of hit and miss implementation of, of egress filtering. Uh, egress filtering is very important to stop uh, your standard malware command and control channels. Um, and just consider the fact for a second that uh, even one port, uh, if you uh, let, if you let one port unrestricted, uninspected, 
out of your network. An attacker can basically tunnel any protocol they want out of that port. Um, all he has to do is, is establish a, a simple SSH connection, an encrypted connection uh, that then uh, can carry protocols encapsulated inside, uh, and then you know they have pretty much a, a full range of access out to their own infrastructure. They can use that connection to um, they can use that connection to launch uh, and manage exploits remotely just tunneling the exploit itself through the internal system so that it's less likely to trip any uh, anti-malware solutions, any uh, IDS or IPS systems on the way in. Physical security, um, getting into the, some of the common themes that we, that we find uh, out in our internal penetration tests, we, we've all heard of the term uh, individual versus distributed responsibility. Uh, most organizations these days, uh, if they have a um, uh, dedicated security force, you know, it's thought of by the general employee populace that security is, is, is strictly their responsibility. Uh, many organizations do not have a dedicated security force. Uh, and so uh, it is thought of as a distributed responsibility amongst uh, all employees. The problem with that is that um, in a distributed environment, um, you know, true responsibility is, is difficult to nail down. Kind of the old adage, uh, and they teach you in, um, you know, uh, first aid and, and uh, those sorts of classes that, um, you know, when you're taking control of an of a accident scene or, or uh, you know, trying to attend to somebody who's uh, having a medical emergency, you need to look at somebody in the eye and explicitly tell that person to call 911. You don't just say somebody call 911 or else it won't happen. Everybody thinks that the other person is doing it. Uh, that's kind of what happens when, when security is a distributed responsibility. Um, if I am walking through a building, I look like I know where I'm going, um, odds are in a distributed responsibility sort of environment, I'm probably not going to get challenged. And the reason for that is because, you know, depending on how large your organization is, how likely is it that I'm unauthorized versus I just haven't, you know, uh, you know, the, the employee just hasn't met me before. Uh, I can tell you that I've been at CORE for, for three years now, and I am still meeting people uh, for the first time that I've corresponded with uh, over email uh, many, many times. It's just the nature of, of uh, the workplace today. We don't see each other as often as we used to. We don't get to know each other uh, as well as we used to, uh, at least not in an in-person perspective. And I don't see that problem changing anytime soon. Uh, when security is, is thought of as an individual's responsibility, say, uh, if there is, um, you know, a receptionist whose job it is to, you know, identify visitors and stop them before they go in, um, the main problem there is you have a single point of failure. Um, you know, your individual uh, who's responsible for security can be very, very good. Uh, however, they are not going to be perfect. And if um, the employees uh, in the facility believe that it is that individual's sole responsibility to provide security, then all you have to do is wait for the right moment, get past that individual, uh, and then, um, you know, you have free room throughout the facility. To give a, a quick little uh, analogy on that, you know, in, in a hockey game, for example, you can have uh, the best goalie uh, in the world. However, uh, even if there are, you know, 50, 60, 70 shots on goal, really the only statistic that matters at the end of the game is the number they got through. Uh, and the best goalie in the world is not going to have a perfect season. They are going to get scored upon. Um, and that's all it takes uh, for an incident to happen in your, in your organization. From a technical perspective, uh, one of the one of the biggest threats that that we are are taking advantage of these days, uh, man in the middle via name resolution. So, 
with the newer versions of operating systems, Microsoft has disabled um, you know, the ages old uh, NetBIOS name service by default. Uh, Microsoft has kind of acknowledged that, all right, NetBIOS name service uh, has some inherent vulnerabilities in it, so we're going we're gonna to disable that by default and, and uh, everything will be okay. But then they went ahead and enabled this new peer-to-peer -peer name resolution protocol called Link Local Multicast Name Resolution. So they are two different protocols. They're shaped slightly differently, but essentially they do the same thing. And what that is, is they identify systems that are not in DNS. Why that's important is these are peer-to-peer -peer protocols where if I am looking for a system that does not exist in, in the DNS infrastructure, uh, I will send a query out to either LLMNR or NDNS and say, hey, is anybody on the network uh, named Steve? Now, if I am here on the network and I'm being malicious, I can simply raise my hand and say, well, hello, Bob, I'm, I'm Steve, you know, uh, what did you need from me? And that doesn't change between LLMNR or NBNS. Um, neither of these protocols have any uh, security built into them or authentication built into them by default. Um, in fact, the RFCs for these protocols uh, pretty plainly state, state that they are not meant for um, managed networks. They are not meant for um, large networks uh, that have DNS as a primary, uh, primary resolution source. That centralized name management gets you a, a lot more uh, security, even though, even, even though uh, DNS-based name resolution uh, can still fall short under cer certain circumstances. Also, uh, cryptography. Um, cryptography kind of touches a, a variety of different topics in penetration testing. Uh, while you may um, have heard a, a lot of SSL-based attacks, uh, you know, Beast, Poodle, those sorts of things. Cryptography also deals with uh, other protocols that, you know, don't get necessarily as much uh, as much press, at least certainly not as often as, as other ones. Um, cryptography is used in authentication protocols. Little snippet right here uh, is uh, taken from a Metasploit module which takes NTLM credentials that were intended for one purpose and then redirects them on to uh, another source. The cryptography is really uh, essential in that process. Um, in systems that perform server message block signing, for example, um, NTLM relay is, is um, more difficult because uh, you are performing that additional check to make sure that that, that SMB packet, that SMB request uh, is valid. Uh, the newer operating systems do enable SMB uh, message block signing uh, by default. Uh, older operating systems, operating systems that, are, that have either left or are leaving support soon, such as uh, Windows Server 2003 and Windows XP, uh, tend to be a little bit more vulnerable to um, NTLM relay. Uh, as an example of, of something that we can do uh, with NTLM Relay is uh, we can uh, listen via NBNS or LLMNR uh, for um, a name resolution. And we can place ourselves in the middle uh, of that conversation uh, by um, performing LLMNR or NBNS spoofing, and then once we are in the middle of that conversation. Um, we can wait for a user that has administrative privileges to pass along uh, an NTLM token. Once that person with administrative privileges sends their token, we send that off to a vulnerable system uh, and say, all right, uh, instead of listing the directories in the shared folder, we want you to create a local account on that system named Core BTS and add it to the administrators group. 
then we all, uh, all of a sudden have local access on that box. Then we can log on to that box and we can um, leverage uh, a number of different um, uh, methods to escalate our privileges uh, to a domain account. For example, we can um, add a startup script to the uh, all users profile, which uh, as soon as the administrator logs onto a system, uh, it will execute under their own user context. Um, you know, if there are any, uh, you know, stored credentials on that, uh, on that system, we can go through and look for those, uh, try to crack them offline uh, using brute force or dictionary attacks. Uh, if there might be any uh, cryptographically weak or, or simply encoded passwords stored on any applications uh, on that system, we can pull them off and we can attempt to, uh, to decode those, uh, those credentials. Not only that, but once we are able to um, achieve a man in the middle position, another nifty trick that we can um, use uh, is web proxy auto detection spoofing. So many organizations um, will have an inline web filter where you don't need to automatically configure your proxies. However, Windows has this inbuilt feature where it looks for a system called WPAD by default to auto-configure proxies and, and let the browser know where it should send its web traffic before actually sending it. If I'm able to listen for that traffic, um, usually again through LLMNR or NBNS, um, you know, in most organizations, they're not going to have a WPAD entry in DNS. Therefore, I see that traffic, I say, I'm WPAD, I can help you configure your proxy. You can send all of your web traffic through me. What that means is that any unencrypted connection, the user is going to have basically no warning that I can see that entire conversation. When you have internal services and systems that are authenticating over plain text HTTP, I now have the ability to view that traffic without any kind of indication or, or, or a warning message by that browser. It thinks everything is fine. In the event that you are using um, uh, encrypted communications for internal systems, your, your users should see an error that says this certificate is not trusted. Um, if the users are not accustomed to seeing these errors, odds are they're going to call the help desk and say, hey, I've got this funny error message on my, uh, on my web browser for all of the secure pages I'm going to. Um, what's up? What's going on? So we have been uh, called out by users before on this. In some instances, we have not. And this is why it is important to make sure that your internal PKI um, is um, properly deployed, properly maintained, so that users are not constantly seeing these SSL certificate errors. If they're accustomed to seeing them all the time and just click through them, then that's exactly what's going to happen, even when uh, it could be um, an actual attack going in the middle. Talking a little bit more about command and control, um, there's a, a story recently about um, Marriott and their justification for sending wireless uh, DOF requests uh, to users' mobile hotspots. Um, now, for those of you who might not be as familiar with wireless, uh, deauthentication is uh, an operation that uh, destroys the, the established connection between a wireless access point and uh, a wireless client. It's used by um, wireless intrusion prevention systems to, excuse me, it's used by wireless intrusion prevention systems to um, more or less deny the ability of a, a rogue wireless access point to operate within the physical range of, um, of the system. So if an employee were to plug their own wireless router into your wired network, 
you could send DOF packets to any client that would connect to this rogue device because you don't know what it's doing. You don't know whether it's inspecting the, the traffic going uh, over those channels or not. The difference here is that the use of personal mobile hotspots uh, has increased drastically over the last couple of years thanks to um, smartphone technology. Uh, pretty much any Android phone made in the last several years can turn itself into a wireless hotspot um, and can provide internet access to um, an individual and the individuals around them over uh, publicly regulated channels. Marriott had said that, all right, well, we need to send out these DOF packets to make sure that nobody is, is uh, you know, doing anything funny on our internal networks. The FCC didn't buy that argument and uh, slapped Marriott with a, a rather large uh, fine, I believe the largest of its kind. So certainly in certain circumstances, the legality of, of um, dealing with out-of-band uh, command and control channels, it, it's murky at best. So you can't focus as much on, on that aspect as you used to be able to. In certain circumstances, perimeter-based measures can be uh, effective. For example, if you have a laptop that um, is infected uh, off of the network and then somebody brings it through the front door, connects it over a wired connection, uh, if you see traffic going out to all of these known bad IP addresses using some sort of reputational-based filter, certainly that is still effective in those uh, situations. Um, Otherwise, uh, again, um, you know, if a bad guy can get in, there is probably going to be a way to get out. So some of the uh, more common and effective control approaches that we see um, comes back to the basics. Patching uh, is the, the number one uh, security operation. Uh, that affects vulnerability um, surface area uh, attack surface area the most. If you're not patching your systems, if you're not patching uh, your devices on your networks, then there's obviously more holes to exploit. Uh, there's more opportunity for us to uh, go in and actually compromise the, uh, the systems, get the data, get the access. Um, configuration management. Um, you know, I'm also including uh, things like, uh, you know, setting access control lists on file shares, making sure that uh, you need to present valid credentials to get access to this information. Uh, if you have open network shares, there's really no need to take advantage of software flaws for that. Um, and, you know, that's what, exactly what the attackers are going to do. They're going to take the least risk uh, path to get to accomplish their goals, just like, uh, just like any of us would. Um, we have seen instances where uh, switch port security and network access control have been deployed uh, to the point where they are effective in preventing us uh, from attaching our equipment to the network uh, on a typical internal penetration task. Uh, it is a very, very resource intensive control, so not everybody has the bandwidth to do it, but if you can, um, Mac-based wired uh, port security uh, can go a long way in, if nothing else, at least alerting systems administrators that um, something untoward might be going on. Segmentation, uh, again, uh, really depends on whether or not there are ACLs in place uh, going between those network segments. Um, segmentation will reduce uh, certain classes of vulnerabilities on its own, such as uh, anything that takes advantage of broadcast traffic, uh, if you cut down the uh, the broadcast uh, the size of broadcast domains, obviously you're going to be able to see less if you have a compromised uh, node on one particular network. But um, certainly that is not the end all and, and be all uh, of that. Not only that, uh, segmentation can also uh, prevent things like uh, HSRP, OSPF, uh, other kind of routing protocols that really um, shouldn't be on user space land. Um, you know, they should be they should be carried explicitly on their own uh, network segments. 
just because, uh, you know, they are designed to uh, be device-to-device, router-to-router protocols, um, and uh, if they are exposed to um, if they are exposed to user traffic, you know, there is the potential for, for direct attack. Um, you know, HSRP is one of those things where, uh, you know, you might be able to uh, insert yourself into that conversation. You might be able to then, uh, you know, become the gateway, become the firewall. Um, as far as protecting the data, um, you know, you have uh, various uh, flavors of data protection out there uh, that can hamper uh, an internal penetration tester. Uh, database and file level encryption can make it more difficult to get uh, to the data uh, if other controls have failed. Um, disk and hardware encryption can, uh, again, assist in um, the, the uh, physical uh, media inspection aspect of an internal penetration test. Um, generally, principle of least privilege access control, again, it's just good security practice. Um, and uh, not only that, you know, things that should be physically secured, put them behind a lock and a key. Um, if, if at all possible, you know, make sure that your data center is um, locked with um, some kind of accountability uh, for who might be going into and out of the data center. Uh, CCTV would be ideal. Um, ideally, the CCTV system would not be in said data center uh, and thus uh, would kind of uh, be vulnerable if somebody were to get access to it in the first place. Uh, data in transit pr uh, protection depends uh, a lot on the health of your, uh, your PKI infrastructure, whether or not your uh, SSL and TLS configurations meet uh, modern standards. Uh, again, with all the attacks that have come out, uh, certainly we have to reshuffle uh, our priorities on some of the protocols that we use. Uh, SSL version 3, uh, now that Poodle has come out, is, is kind of a, uh, um, it's a protocol that should be phased out wherever possible uh, and move to uh, more of the, the TLS uh, stack of, of protocols. Not only that, uh, wireless network encryption, uh, also very, uh, very important to protect data in transit. Now, protecting the facility and the employees is always the, uh, uh, the hardest, hardest part to, to uh, maintain. Um, I, I do like to say that, um, you know, your physical security is, is only as good as your newest employee. Uh, again, those of us in the security field tend to forget that, you know, there are people out there that uh, don't think like us and have never had reason to, to think like us. They, they still, um, you know, shake, uh, you know, extend a hand to, to, to shake another person's hand and, and don't think that, you know, necessarily there is that risk they could be there to do something uh, that, uh, that would harm them or the company. So one of the advantages of penetration test is it kind of gives people an exposure to that, um, you know, in a, a controlled environment. Physical access control systems can only do so much uh, if you're relying strictly on a physical access control system to make sure that, uh, you know, there aren't any uh, unauthorized individuals in your um, facility, I would ask you to do the, the following mental exercise. Think about how many access control doors there are uh, in your facilities. Then think of the number of, of employees uh, that there are in that facility. Now, every time you open that door, that door is unlocked for a certain period of time, whether you are waiting to open it, opening it, going through it, or whether it's closing. That means that there is a certain period of time per person uh, that somebody else can grab that door and follow, follow behind them. When you are at peak hours, for example, as people are getting in within uh, you know, about 15 minutes of 8 o'clock, uh, 15 minutes after 8 o'clock, somewhere in that time window, think about the number of people that could be going through that door per minute, and then calculate how long that door is unlocked for, uh, during that time. That kind of shows you uh, really where your, your vulnerability is to uh, things, like, uh, things like tailgating. Um, 
again, and that goes back to where people believe that physical responsibility for physical security lies. Um, a lot of uh, individuals don't feel comfortable um, literally closing the door behind them so that somebody else has to swipe their badge coming through. Uh, a lot of people will think, well, you know, I probably just never met this person. Maybe they hear it from another office. Um, so those are things that you kind of have to work out culturally within your organization and, and kind of set where the boundaries are. Um, other than that, uh, you know, physical information security awareness training can go a long way toward uh, uh, securing, um, you know, your employees, making sure that they are at least aware of the threats that are out there uh, and the sorts of things that they can do uh, to help everybody around them. So thank you very much again for, for joining us today. Um, right now, now at this point, uh, I'd be open to any questions that are out there. Yeah, we'll let everyone type in, but one of the questions that came in was just, Nick, uh, around, you know, any kind of, like, recommendations for like, more information, like any resources that you might be aware of, you know, the folks can use. Um, with regard to any specific topic or? Just around penetration testing, attack and defense, that, you know, it was just, hey, any more, any more links for more information? So maybe we'll keep a general touch on a couple of things. Sure, yeah. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, as far as penetration testing is concerned, there's a lot of information out there uh, about the, the newest vulnerabilities. Um, you know, the exploit DB uh, does a pretty good job of, of keeping track of uh, the newest technical vulnerabilities that are out there. Um, in addition, there are a number of, of media outlets that uh, specialize in, uh, you know, hacking news and, and uh, those sorts of uh, those sorts of things. Uh, SANS Internet Storm Center uh, does a, a pretty good job of um, describing the newest malware, the newest uh, vulnerabilities as they come out and kind of putting a little bit of perspective on, um, you know, how dangerous is this for, for our, our organization. Um, by and large, uh, I'll tell you what I do. Uh, I have uh, a list of, of my favorite news outlets on uh, RSS, and I just go through and uh, check them every day for, for the latest and greatest, and, um, you know, that does a, a pretty good job for me. Anything, like for me, jumps out, things like Krebs, you know, Krebs on security is usually decent, kind of accessible to technical folks, it's accessible to management folks. It might not be the latest and greatest on every exploit, but he certainly covers some of the bigger ones. Um, I think the Stans Internet Storm Center, that's a great one for usually more technical folks will get some value out of that. And, and it's one that's been around for years, but I don't think everyone is, is always aware of how good the information is actually there. Right, right. And Krebs, that, that, that's definitely a good suggestion because not only does he go into the technical aspect, he also goes into uh, the, the social societal aspect of, uh, you know, who are these individuals, you know, what are their, what's their end game? You know, uh, he's done a lot of interviews and, uh, and uh, exposés on, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the Eastern European uh, pharma gangs uh, that are responsible for a lot of the um, you know, spam and, and, and uh, you know, um, online pharmacy defacements that have happened. Yeah. So. And some other things that are kind of related are, you know, if you wanted to get your hands on, like, a pen testing distribution, you know, Kali Linux has kind of become the de facto standard. If you might have heard of Backtrack before, that's been around for years and years and years. It's certainly not the only one, but uh, I know we use it a bunch. Uh, it has a lot of tools built in, kind of ready to go. Um, it used to be more of a thing, more challenging to actually build your, your pen testing laptop and, yep. and backtrack, and now, now Cali made it a bit easier. But it, it's definitely worth it if you want to get some hands-on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If, if you um, prefer uh, more of the Red Hat flavors of Linux, I know that there's a, a security spin for, for Fedora. Uh, it has a lot of the security tools built into it already, and whatever it doesn't have built into it, it might uh, have the ability to add via uh, standard RPM or, or young packages. But um, certainly um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of options out there for other things that, uh, that you can do. Uh, one of the reasons why Kali is, is so popular is that it's also 
um, across platform. Uh, it, it is available on ARM architecture as well, so you can load it onto things like a Raspberry Pi or other uh, small device, small form factor device uh, to um, really take advantage of, of some some little niche uh, bits of functionality. Yeah. And that's something that we've, not necessarily with a Raspberry Pi, but I mean, we've, you've done some things with um, some, I'll call them non-standard, you know, that's not a workstation. Um, again, kind of just ripping here, but maybe speak to that. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there are these tiny little devices out there that, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't recognize them as a fully functioning computer. Uh, for example, things like your, your Chromecasts, your Rokus, your, um, you know, Amazon TV, Apple TVs, um, you know, these are all fully functioning computers that have networking, processing, and memory integrated into them. Um, you know, there are these HDMI uh, sticks, for the, the lack of a better term, uh, that, you know, you have the ability to, to load uh, malicious software on these devices, uh, and then they can be placed on the network. They can stay there indefinitely, and uh, they can provide uh, avenues of attack. They can provide um, that foothold and attacker needs on a network. So uh, absolutely, a lot of um, a lot of potential there. Uh, not only that, but um, you know there are embedded devices uh, such as uh, Arduinos and, and other micro uh, uh, controller-based uh, uh, architectures that are, are capable of uh, all kinds of uh, signals processing and um, you know, basic, uh, you know, physical layer uh, exploitation that, you know, hadn't really been as accessible um, in the last several years, now definitely increasing in popularity. And I know you've even used that, you know, on a pen test multiple times, mm -hmm. so, you know, on internal side, just drop it and then, you know, you have a nice remote connection and can sit and work from wherever. Absolutely, absolutely. They have uh, they have battery power, so they've got longevity. Uh, if you can't find anywhere to plug them in directly, you know something as simple as a uh, uh, as a tablet or a, uh, an old Android phone can also be used as a penetration testing platform. Great, and that was really it. Um, and we can certainly hang on the line for another minute or two here and let anyone ask any other questions, but. Um, um, you know, Nick, thank you for pulling that together. Um, I think it was some great content. It should facilitate some questions from the audience maybe over the next couple of days. But again, it'll be uploaded to the Core BTS's YouTube page over the next little bit, and uh, you'll get a message from us um, that, that it's there and, and ready to check out. But um, please have our contact information, really anyone on the Core side. Uh, we'd be happy to have just a, you know, a high-level conversation, a technical conversation. Uh, please, you know, utilize us as a resource. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and uh, just to, to echo what Matt said, uh, feel free to reach out if there are any questions. I'd be more than happy to uh, serve as a resource. Yeah. Anna, is there anything else before we uh, part ways today with the group? That's all. I think just uh, on behalf of all of us here at Core BTS, thanks for joining us. Uh, and look for an email in your inbox with a link to the recording in the next uh, 48 hours or so. Great. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.